Hey guys, what's up? Thank you so much for tuning in today here at Elevate Church. We know that today's message is going to rock your world and elevate you to the next level in your life. So sit back, relax, and enjoy the message. Did I call it or did I call it? You know, we, we, had, uh, we had our, uh, our Super Bowl tailgate party here. We had, you know, all kinds of food and everything. And you know what? The haters were hating. You should have seen them like, like the first three quarters, they just kept laughing at me. Even at one point, some of the guys that came up, do you guys remember my, my big old, uh, you know, cut out of Tom Brady with his, you know? They grabbed some tissue boxes and they're like putting Kleenex at his eyes. And... <laughs> but isn't that like the enemy, right? He just laughs when you're going down. You know, the game was pressure. Oh, trust me, I felt the pressure. Because on Sunday, I'm like, man, we're going to take it. We're going to win the Super Bowl. And then the first three quarters, I'm like, oh, my God, i got to show up next Sunday. And they're going to make fun of me. They're going to be talking smack. And, but the reality and the truth is that, you know what, that sometimes in life, it does feel like a Super Bowl. And, and you're fighting and you're pressing and, and you're trying to just win in life. But then how many know that life happens? Stuff happens. You get hit. Listen, football is all about contact. There is a constant contact. There are hits. There are cuts. There are pains. There is suffering. And sometimes you break some bones as you're just trying to win the Super Bowl of life. It comes with the territory. But how many know that, like David facing a Goliath, you know what? Here's what I want to encourage you with today. You know what? If you're facing a giant today, if there is a giant in front of you right now, let me tell you why that giant's there. Because right beyond that giant is an awesome promise. There's a breakthrough. There's a victory. There's something so much greater than what you're facing right now. But you got to face the giant. And you're going to win because God is with you. But you also have to understand that the kingdom, and listen, sometimes we think that once we get saved, that it's a walk in the park or it's a stroll through the garden. By far is it a stroll through the garden. Let me show you real quickly. If you have the Elevate Church app, open it up. My notes are in there and you can follow along. But I want to read to you today Matthew chapter 11 because when you think about football, there's always a pushback. There's always a setback. And maybe right now you feel like in life there's been some setbacks, whether it's financially Maybe there's a setback in your marriage. Maybe there's a setback in your career. Maybe there's a setback with your children. I don't know what setback you're facing right now, but when you are in the game of life, there will be pushbacks, setbacks, pains, hurts, brokenness, all those things, they come. And Jesus, I love Jesus because you know what? He kept it real. If you're going to hang with Jesus, if you're going to follow Jesus, he doesn't give you this, this pretentious idea that everything is going to be peachy king. Now, he did say this. He says, you know what? When you go through trials, troubles, or tribulations, he said, be of good cheer because you know what? I've already overcome that. The question is, is can you stay in the game even when you're losing? Even when it's all falling apart, can you stay in the game? Can you be faithful? Can you stay committed? Can you continue to push forward? Can you rally with your team and say, you know what? Right now we're losing. You know what? At halftime, I came up here and I said, hey. They're all laughing at me during halftime. I came up. They laughed at me. Nah. I'm like, that's okay. Here's what's happening right now. I said, Tom Brady's getting all his team. And they're reflecting on what's happened in the first two quarters. They're, 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 they're talking about their mistakes. They're talking about their setbacks, their fallbacks, their fumbles, their stumbles. You name it. And I said, but watch this. I said, but they're going to have a comeback. And, of course, we had a comeback, and then we were still hurting at the third quarter. But let me tell you something. Maybe you're at your final quarter. <laughs> Maybe you're at your final nine minutes. But how many know that, though that is an earthly game, God's Super Bowl is supernatural. God can supernaturally do something in your life right now if you're willing to give him a chance. Because the truth is that we already know how the book ends. You win. Look at this. He says this. Since the days of John the Baptist, the kingdom of heaven is like roses. It's like a merry-go-round. It's like a swing. Push me, daddy. 
No, the kingdom of heaven suffers violence. And it, I love this. Look, the kingdom of heaven has been under attack and, and it suffers violence, but people are taking a hold of it. Now, I don't know about you, but since I've become a Christian, I've been under attack. I wish I could tell you that you know what the attacks have stopped. They have not stopped. Attacks are faithful, man. They're like bills. They show up every month on time. <laughs> they are. Uh, I have not stopped being attacked. It's, it's constant. It's, it's ongoing. It, it never stops. But, but realize this, that when you're going to live for a kingdom, come on, for some of you men that you love, like the men stuff, you like the man stuff, well, guess what, man? The kingdom is all about force. It's all about win. It's all about fight. And so the kingdom of heaven has been under attack. And it says, and it's been like that since the days of John the Baptist. And it says, and the violent people are taking hold of it. Now, does that mean you're violent and you're cray-cray and you're like, Beating on people, hurting people. No. You know what that means? It means that your faith in Christ is so violent that you'll believe even when you're losing in life. I faith forward. Is it easy to live in faith? No. I always say this. Faith is not easy, but it's not hard also. It's a choice. We have to choose to faith. It's a choice. We have to choose to fight. We have to choose to progress. Are you here today? Is that the kind of message you were expecting today? I hope it was. Good. So there are setbacks. There are setbacks. There are hurts. There are pains. But with God, there's also promise. There's also prosperity with God. Right? That doesn't just mean money. You know, you can have prosperous a family. You can have prosperous, you know, relationships. You can be prosperous in, in, in your career and, and, and your call. And, and so God wants to progress some people, but everyone wants a God promise, but not the process. Everybody wants the promise of God. Everyone does. But let me tell you something. I mean, just... Think, please, think with me. I want God's promise, but I don't want his process. How does that make sense? That's like trying to say, okay, that's like saying nothing plus nothing equals 10. There's no way. You need a process five plus five. Remember the teacher? Any teachers in the house today? Any teachers? Well, awesome. Any other teachers in the house? Awesome, two, three teachers. Okay, we got three teachers. Four teachers. Wow, four teachers. Okay, well, you remember this, the five apples, you know? Five apples plus five apples equals what? Okay, all right. So here we have, we have another, another one here. Uh, seven plus three equals, I'm sorry, seven plus three equals what? I'm not a teacher. <laughs> uh, nine plus one equals? Okay, so there's a process to the equation. There's a process to the promise. You can't have a promise without a process. Some of you, you've been waiting for a promise for a very long time. I'm waiting. But guess what? But while I'm waiting, I'm not doing nothing because nothing plus nothing equals nothing. <laughs> I want to change, but you're doing nothing. Tell me how that's working. Nothing plus nothing equals, but I want to promise. Then do something. Okay, let's keep talking. I lost some of you. You're like, dang, you mean you got to do something? Yeah. <laughs> I mean, you look at Elevate Church. People come here and they're like, wow. Man, this is awesome. Wow. This is amazing. Yeah, but you weren't here on day one. <laughs> there have been hurts here. There has been pain here. There has been suffering here. There has been all kinds of challenges here. We have been through process after process. Yes, Elevate Church has a promise, but not without a process. 
And if this is your home, if this is where God called you to, guess what? There is a process that you and I must go through. And you know what? You can't skip the process. Look at Chambers say, you can't skip the process. can't skip it. Come on, stop being skippy. It just, let me get your help. Come over here with me. Sir, would you help me? Yeah, come on up here real quick. This is crazy. Look, look at your neighbor and say, stop it, skippy. <laughs> I mean, let's just say that, uh, that we were going to go hang out tomorrow, right? And I say, hey, uh, <laughs> uh, meet me at the church. And uh, you know what? We're going we're gonna to go to this really cool restaurant down the street. It's like maybe four blocks away. We can walk. Come on. Let's not be lazy, right? And all of a sudden, let's say us three started skipping all the way there. So just follow me. Ready? <laughs> One, two, three. Ready? Let's go. <laughs> Come on. Keep going. Come on. Keep going. Come on, and, we're, and we're, let's say we were doing this for three blocks. No, don't run. I say skip. Yeah, don't break the rules. Skip. How goofy do we look? Can you imagine? I just got back from New York City, going to New York City, and everybody and their mother were skipping. That, that would be a little... A little wacky, a little weird. I'd be like, what the? Give these guys a big hand. Thank you so much. Listen, listen. Just like you wouldn't skip to get to places, God says that the steps of a righteous man and woman of God are ordered by him. He didn't say the skips of a righteous man and woman of God are ordered by him. There is no skip with God. There is only steps. And sometimes the steps that you have to take are sometimes steps of suffering, steps of pain, steps of setbacks, steps of pushbacks, steps of hurts. But you know what? But you have to go through the step because if you don't step through it, and I say through it because you're not going to stay there forever, you will not pass go. You won't. And guess what? You can change steps. You can change lanes. But the finish line remains the same. Okay. <laughs> Romans 5, 1 through 5, quickly. It says, therefore, since we have been justified through what? Come on, say this with me. We've been justified through what? How are you justified? Are you justified by your lack? No. Are you justified by your circumstance? No. You're justified through faith. He says this, we have peace with God through the Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have gained access by, you want to break the line? Faith. Come on, the Super Bowl, the only reason that they got their win was because they chose to have faith. Now, their faith was in a game. Their faith was in getting that little, uh, you know, ball through the, through the uh, end zone. But the prize that we have is so much greater. And the only way to get through, the only access point is faith in Christ Jesus. There is no other way. He is the access point. And so he says we access by faith into the grace in which we now stand and boast in the hope of the glory of God. Now here's where it gets really juicy. Not only so, but we also glory in our... We glory in them. But have you noticed that when Christians are suffering with something, they get wacky? I know a lot of Christians that get really weird when they go through stuff. When all is well, they're like happy, cheery, amazing, yay, praise God. And they go through a little some something, and it's just all of a sudden it's like, woe is me. Let me tell you something. 
The kingdom of God is all about contact. We have to choose. Listen, I get it. We all have moments. I get it. We all have moments. But if that's your pattern, what's wrong with you? Because your pattern says a lot about your behavior. One moment you're good, the next moment you're funky. No. We glory in the sufferings. What are you going through? I got cancer. But God is good. How can it be good when you're in cancer? Because God is good regardless. He's faithful. I know. I've been there. Nurses tell me, how are you doing today? I'm blessed. If you're so blessed, then why are you here? I've had people tell me that. And you know what my response is? Yeah, I may be here now, but I got an end zone. Suffering, you rejoice in your suffering. Because we know that suffering, suffering produces something. You know what it produces? Perseverance. Oh, man, my team was suffering on Super Bowl. Oh, yeah. But they're suffering. You see, when pressure's on, something is coming out. And hopefully, it's the perseverance. Once you put me in a place of pressure, man, perseverance is going to come out of me. All the more I will press towards the mark of God's, God's high calling. All the more I'm going to push. I'm not just going to sit there and whine about my loss. They could have just quit. You know what happened? You know why the Falcons lost? Because they quit at the third quarter. They got comfortable. How many of us in Christianity, we get comfortable with our faith? All of a sudden, then we're just cruising. Then we're just kind of like, man, worship is boring. Man, you just get, you get lethargic. You get, and then you start blaming it on the pastor. It's normally blame it on me. Just so you know. Oh, yeah, all the time. Get emails and I'm not being fed. Like, dang, I didn't know you were my baby. <laughs> If you were my child, you'd obey. <laughs> oh, I'll preach right there. I'll stay right there. Oh, we'll stay. Oh, yeah. Because we know that suffering produces perseverance. Perseverance produces what? Character. And character is the only thing that can sustain you when you're going through something. It reveals the real man. It reveals the real woman you are. And character produces hope. Look at this. And hope does not put us to shame because God's love has been poured out into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. And so he's saying, hey, listen, I have equipped you with every spiritual gift that comes from above. And you have everything it takes within you and within reach in order for you to press through, to press forward, and to win this race. Amen. Is it, can we give Jesus a big hand clap of prayer? Praise. Yes. So tell Skippy to stop it. It's not even biblical. Psalms 23 3 says this. It says, He restores my soul. He leads me. Ever say, He leads me. He leads me in the paths of righteousness for His name. Sake. And as I started reading this, I think sometimes we think that he leads me in the path of righteousness. We're thinking of just a rose garden, like just rose petals. All of us just like, yay. No. Let me tell you something. If that was the case, man, you know what? There would be nothing to fight for. You know what? The only thing you fight for is something that's worth fighting for. Let's just take, let's take, let's take the path of righteousness of Daniel was a lion's den. That was the path to righteousness. You know what? You can be doing all things right and still things go wrong in your life. You can be on the right path of God and still be caught up in the lion's den. But how many know that even though Daniel ends up in the lion's den because someone was lying about him, he shut the mouth of the lion. 
The path of righteousness looks like Meshach, Shadrach, and Abednego when they're now in a fiery furnace because they refuse to bow down to any idol. The path of righteousness is like a woman by the name of Esther who was willing to lose her life for the sake of helping others. Are you with me today? That's the path of righteousness. The path of righteousness sometimes doesn't look like the way you think it should be. Sometimes the path of righteousness looks like this and you're all over the place, but God is with you. It kind of reminds me when Nebuchadnezzar said, hey, hey, didn't we throw three guys in that fairy furnace because they refused to worship me? They refused to worship my idol? And it was like, oh, yes, King Nebuchadnezzar, you did. You had three guys. It's Meshach, Shadrach, and Abednego. And then the king's like, oh, my God, but wait a minute. Something's got to be wrong because, you know what I see one two three and now I see four and the and the fourth man looks like the son of God you see sometimes in your darkest hour you may feel lonely you may feel like no one's there to help but God said I will never leave you I will never forsake you I will be with you and so at any hour of your life right now the Lord is with you he's with you He's for you. He's not against you. He's not planning. He says the plans I have for you are plans to give you a future with hope, not to harm you. Are you here today? So the path of righteousness sometimes is the path of suffering. But it's all for his name's sake. Because guess what? At the end of all that suffering, you got a testimony now. You got something to talk about. When you hear someone at your workplace that says, hey, guess what? You know, my so-and-so cousin is, just got, you know, diagnosed with cancer. I've been through cancer. Let me talk to her. Why? Because I've already suffered that, and I got my victory, and I, can, I have something to say. I, I, I know how to fight when it comes to cancer. Can I talk with her? When you've been broke, busted, and, 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 and you've been through, through all kinds of chapter 11s and everything, but then you know what? You got wisdom from God, and now you recover not only what you had, you recovered beyond what you had, and now you're walking in prosperity, be, and you're blessed coming in, and you're blessed going out because you've finally chosen how to take the path of God's financial plan for your life, and now you got something to say when sister so-and-so is saying, I got nothing, and you can say, you know what, but I know how to get out of debt. What good does it do you to be a Christian and then have no story? Why? What good does it do you to be this believer, but you're not making believers out of you? I want people to walk into math, my path of righteousness, and through my path, I can bring you some hope. Right? If not, then what are we doing? Are we just hanging out? Are we just chilling? Are we just enjoying our blessed assurance? Our blessed assurance? It's the Greek. It's the Greek. Look at your neighbor say, don't skip the process. Listen, when you're tired, that doesn't mean stop. When you're hurt, that doesn't mean stop. When you're offended, that doesn't mean stop. When you got drama in your life, that doesn't mean stop. You don't stop when you're hurt. You don't stop when you're losing. You don't stop when you have nothing. Because nothing plus nothing equals what? You don't stop. You keep going. Because God has placed everything within your reach. And within your reach, let's start with number one, the Bible. <laughs> It's within your reach. You want an answer? Open the book. And he brings answers. You don't stop when you don't feel like everything's going right. Guess what? If you just go based on what you feel, your feelings are going to take you to a lot of bad places. 
You don't go by what you feel. He says you're justified, justified by faith, not by feelings. I don't feel the Lord right now. Good, because he's not a feely God. He's a, I know he's with me. When Meshach, Shadrach, and Abednego chose to take the path of righteousness in this fiery furnace, they decided to do that because they said, because the Lord is with us. Quickly, let's go. You guys ready to get out of here? Quick, 2 Kings, fast, fast, let's get out of here. 2 Kings 13, 14, 19. You guys ready? Okay, now watch this. Because listen, having a promise doesn't mean you're not going to suffer. Uh, if you're going to come to this church, I'm going to tell you the truth because the truth makes us free. Okay? And it's good because we win. We win. We win. Okay, now look. Now, Elisha had been suffering from the illness from which he died. Now, Elisha was a great prophet, guys. How is it that a great man of God would die of an illness? How is that? But we don't know why. But he was suffering. Did God use him? Heck yeah. Heck to the yeah. He used them big time. He, God did some great miracles through his life. Do you hear him complaining? No. He's in bed. Okay, fine. He's got an illness. And check this out. And so from this illness from which he died, uh, uh, and, and it says, and, and, and Je Jehoash, uh, the king of Israel, went down to see him, and he wept over him, and he said, my father, my father, he cried. The chariots and horsemen of Israel. Pause. The chariots and horsemen of Israel. Do you know why he called them that? Let me tell you why. Let's go blue. Check this out. Elisha had a moment where he was hanging with his assistant. God gave Elisha and his assistant a command a promise of something that he needed to do in him and through him. However, there was a bright morning where the assistant woke up before Elisha. And the assistant walks down. He's like, oh, oh. right in the middle of a field, right in the middle of a valley. But you know what he notices? He notices something that was uh, not good. He was surrounded. He was surrounded by a huge army, by an enemy. And check this out. There was no way in and there was no way out. And then all of a sudden, you know what? The assistant freaks out. He's like, oh, my God. He's just looking at the circumstance. And he starts freaking out, going nuts. And then he goes and he wakes up Elijah. And he says, oh, my God, Elijah, we're going to die. He's like, well, okay, slow down. What's wrong? Okay. I woke up before you. <laughs> And when I went outside, <laughs> I yawned and I, dude, just get to the point. Well, <laughs> we're surrounded by an enemy. We're going to die. And you know what Elijah said? He's like, okay, let's go. Come with me. Come with me, servant. <sighs> and then he's like, okay, all right, we got a problem. Houston, we have a problem. But check this out. But, but Elisha, he, 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 he was so justified by his faith. Not a perfect man, but a man who trusted God. Remember last week's point? There's one thing is believing God and another thing is trusting him. Because a lot of people believe in God here. If I said, how many believe in God? I'll tell you, probably 99.9% .9 of the people here would lift your hand. I believe him. Yeah, but how many trust his plan? That's a whole other level. And so he says, hey, listen, I know you believe in God. <laughs> But let's trust his plan. And so you know what he does, Elisha? When, when you have a connection with God, you start thinking a little bit different. Instead of freaking out with your family, freaking out with your business, freaking out with everybody and just going nutty, nutty, you know what you do? Is that's where you begin to apply and put into action this wonderful thing called faith. And you say like this. He grabbed his, his assistant. He said, Father, I pray that you would open his eyes to see. And you know what? I, I believe that this is the season where we have to pray, God, open our spiritual eyes to see what you see. Because what you're facing now, there's something so much greater behind that, that the enemy does not want you to see. 
but Elisha had this justified faith. He had this awesome connection with God where he started learning how to see beyond his circumstance and he started seeing the future and the hope that God promised. You see, you'll never get to the other side until you finally get to the place where you can see what God sees even when you don't see nothing happen. And he says, Father, open his eyes. And then guess what? His eyes were open, his spiritual eyes. And then his assistant, his servant, the Bible says, was like, yeah, yeah, walk, look around. Just be like, dang, oh, my God. And he's like freaking out like, oh, my. Was he still surrounded by the enemy? Yes. Was, was it still freaky scary? Yes. But you know what the servant saw? He saw what Elisha saw. You can sit down. You know what Elisha said? He said, can you see? And the servant said, oh, yeah, I can see. He said, that's right. You can see that there's more with us than there is of them. What am I saying? Here's what I'm telling you. Right now, you're probably surrounded by all kinds of crap. But guess what? God surrounds whatever's surrounding you right now. That's my God. He will surround whatever is surrounding you. Give him a greater hand clap of praise. Okay, and so let's keep reading. We're done. We're done. We're done. Okay, uh, where did I leave off at? My father, chariot. Oh, yeah, and so that's why I said the chariots of horsemen and horsemen of Israel. Let me tell you something. When you've been through something, now you've got something to talk about. As a matter of fact, people will mark you as something awesome. He literally called a man. This is the dude who is the man of chariots and horsemen. I love that. He was marked in his suffering. Look at the next verse. Are you ready? Elisha said, okay, uh, king, here's what I want you to do. I want you to get a bow. Everybody say, get a bow. Get a bow. And I want you to grab some arrows. And he did so. What did God say? Get a bow. Right? This was the man of God. The man of God was giving the king a word from heaven. You know what? He's like all trying to impress Elisha. And Elisha's like, hey, dude, just go get a bow and get some arrows. And it says, and then he did. How many of us, God tells us to do something and we don't do what he said for us to do? We don't do it. We don't respond. We, I'll pray about that. I, I don't like it. When I tell people, you should serve and get like, I'll pray about that. There's nothing to pray about. Jesus gave his life for you. He didn't pray about dying for your sins. He didn't pray about forgiving you. He didn't pray about saving you. He didn't pray about it. He chose to fight the good fight of faith so that we would be set free from the adversary, the enemy. So what's there to pray about when it comes to serving God? What's there to pray about? That's just spooky spiritual because you know you're not praying about it. That's just the new spiritual way of saying, heck no, I ain't going to serve. Let's just be real. I mean, let's, if we're going to come, let's, let's have some contact. Right? Let's have some, let's have some, uh. You know what happens? Once you get the hit, you realize, dang, I'm in the game. If you haven't been hit, you'll never be in the game. Let me pray about it. Don't ever, don't ever tell me that. Because <laughs> I'll pray for you. I'll cast that demon out of you. <laughs> pray about it. Be all spiritual. Okay, let's move on because that may offend some people today. Uh, and Elisha said, get a boy and some arrows. And he did so. And he said to him, take the bow in your hands. And, and look, and he said to the king of Israel, when he had taken it, Elisha put his hands on the king's hands. And he said, open the east window. And he said, and he opened it. Notice direction after direction. Do this, and he did it. Do that, and he does it. How many times do you give people counsel, you give people wisdom, and they don't do it? Constantly. Here's what you should do. Okay, and then you don't do nothing. Nothing. And so he says, grab a bow. This is my bow. And he said, and I want you to grab some arrows, right? And, and it says, and look at this. And he says, and once you open the east window, everybody say aim. aim. 
That's a weak aim. Say it again. Ready? One, two, three. Aim. He says, you know what? The reason you open that east window is because you got to start learning who your real adversary is. Let's open the east window. He was very specific. He says, you open that east window and you do what? Shoot. And Elijah said, and he shot, and the Lord's arrow of what? Victory. Heck yeah. The arrow of victory over what? Aram. God has the arrow of victory for your Aram right now. But you got to pick up your bow, and you got to get your arrows, and you got to open the east window. You got to aim, and you got to shoot, because that arrow is going to bring you back a victory. And he says... Elisha declared, you will completely destroy the Arameans at Aphek. And then he said, take the arrows, man. And the king took them like he was all that in a bag of tortillas. And Elisha told him, strike the ground. And he struck it, how many times? And he did what? Okay, stop right there at that verse. Did he tell him how many times to strike the ground? What did he tell him to do? He told him, grab your bow, get your arrows, open the east window, aim, shoot, and then shoot the ground. What does he do? <laughs> and he shoots nothing. I'm going to get this, baby. Let's try that. Ooh, yeah. Come on, somebody. <laughs> and so, listen. So he grabs the bow. He grabs the arrows. And he shoots three on the ground. And then he what? He shot three in the ground and then he did what? He shot how many in the ground? And then he did what? Next verse. And the man of God, Elisha, was angry at him. Like, why do Christians get so touchy when they get corrected? Yeah, amen. Hey, hey, come on over here. I'll do it. Why, why do Christians get so touchy when they're being corrected? Why? Pride, dumb, stupid. Oh, and I've been that before. I, I've been stupid. I've been dumb. You're just not willing to admit it. <laughs> I've been prideful. You know what's funny is when Moses wrote in the Bible, Moses, the humblest man on earth. Dude, you just wrote about yourself. <laughs> And so the man of God was angry with him, and he said, dude, you should have struck the ground five or six times. In other words, some, how many arrows do you have? <laughs> I got six. And, and, how, and you shot how many? Three. <laughs> and who told you to stop? Who told you? And look, and, and he says, and then, then if you would have just, if you would have just gone a little further, man, look, then you would have defeated Aram and completely destroyed it. If you would have just gone just a little bit more, if you would have just fought a little bit stronger, if you would have just stopped complaining and whining, and if you would have just taken five more steps, you would have completely destroyed Aram. But now, you will only defeat him three times. Is that the last verse? That's the last verse. Listen to me. Some of us have stopped. Some of us have stopped. Here's why. Some of us have stopped because we're waiting for God to do the next thing. But let me be honest with you. 
there are things right now that are not happening in your life, not because God doesn't want to do anything, but God will not do something when you have something within reach, which are all your arrows. He's already given you the victory, so your job is to shoot every single arrow until you're out. He didn't say shoot until you feel like you want to stop now. You don't stop. You don't quit. When you're hurt, you don't stop. When your feelings are hurt, you don't stop. When you're going down financially, you don't stop. Think about it. Why don't you stop breathing then when it's all going down? Because that would be a bad thing. Who told you to stop? Who told you to stop serving God? Who told you to stop being faithful to God? Who told you to stop giving to God? Who told you to stop loving people? Who told you to stop pursuing the passion that God has placed within your heart? I get it. We all have dreams. But sometimes our dreams are not God's dreams. And your dream must die so that God's dream can live. Stop. Who told you to stop? You keep going. You keep fighting. Can you imagine if the Patriots decided just to quit? We wouldn't have a miracle that took place on Super Bowl Sunday. They broke every record. And you know what, the, you know what they said about Tom Brady? He was the sixth, it was like the sixth draft. Th this guy was overlooked by everyone. You know what? Maybe you have felt that you've been overlooked by all kinds of people, but God has not overlooked you. Who told you to stop? Stand to your feet. Who told you to stop? Look at your neighbor and say, who told you that, man? If you're a note taker, grab your pens and your, your app quickly, quickly. I'm going to give you these points. Everybody say aim. aim. Shoot. Aim. And don't stop. It's funny. I hear people say, man, I I'm poor. You know, it's been my history. It's been, my, it's been, my, it's been in, my, in, my, in my family line. Then do something, man, and stop being poor. Uh, I, I, I'm just so sick and tired of my job. But you keep talking smack about your do job, but you keep showing up every day. Then do something. You know, pastor, you know what? I don't, I'm not passionate about God like you. Then get passionate. Do something. Do something. Do something. Don't just be relaxed. Don't just get comfortable. Do something. Man, our business is falling apart. Then do something. Take action. Get another arrow. Maybe you missed that shot, but guess what? You got six more arrows. You don't stop. You don't quit. There's no quitters in the kingdom of God. Two-thirds of God's name is go. So if you're a son of God or a daughter of the Most High God, then when will you act like it? I don't stop. I don't stop worshiping God. I don't stop praising God. I don't stop coming to church. I've been going to church for 20 years. Years and I have not missed one Sunday for 20 years. The only day I missed church is when I landed in a hospital bed with cancer, and at that point, I had no choice. But even then, I made them take off everything, and I went to church and got sick and came right back. But at least <laughs> I didn't stop. Who told you to stop? God, I just pray that you would give us all a spirit of perseverance, God. That we would not stop for no one, for nothing. Come on, lift your hands to heaven. Jesus, come on, say this to me. Say, Jesus, help me to never stop loving you, serving you. Declare in your name, Jesus, help me by your Holy Spirit to not quit 
or give up. I will fight the good fight of my faith. I will faith forward. Jesus, help me this day to not give in. You got to be like, like the story again of Elijah and his servant when he said the rain is coming. And seven times he went and nothing. But on the seventh time, he says, well, I don't see rain, but I do see a cloud the size of a man's hand. And you know what Elijah said to him? <laughs> Get ready because the rain is coming. The flood is coming. The blessing is coming. The breakthrough is coming. Your healing is coming. Your joy is coming. Your prosperity is coming. Come on, your laughter is coming. Come on, your peace is coming. Get ready, get ready, get ready. Come on, your breakthrough is coming. It is coming, it is coming. But you must be justified by your faith in Christ Jesus. You will not stop. You will continue to believe. You will continue to stand. You will continue to, to, to declare the faithful promises of God. But you're also willing to accept the process in the name of Jesus. Okay, now take these quick notes quickly. If you're a note taker, take them. If you're not a note taker, you can become one today for free 99. Number one, quickly, three arrows to victory. Number one, take hold of it by faith. That means you got to embrace the promise, number one. Number two, accept the process for the path to righteousness. Okay, right now, just accept it. Okay, my life is crappy right now. Well, God says that I can make a right thing out of a crappy thing. Number three, don't stop. Everything you need is within your reach. He told the king, dude, why'd you stop? You have three more arrows. Who told you that? In that same attitude, today I want to give someone here the greatest invitation that you'll ever receive in your life. And it's an invitation to healing, forgiveness. We have all messed up at some point in our life. And we continue to mess up. But there's a God in heaven who loved you and I so much that he was willing to sacrifice, not only sacrifice his son, but allow his son to suffer all the pain of something called sin that he brought upon himself who is perfect so that you and I can have life with him. Here's the truth. Jesus said this, I am the only way. I'm the only truth and I'm the only life and no one comes to the Father except through me. Listen, you will all expire at some point in this life. Nobody is promised tomorrow, not even I. But there's one who promises eternal life and his name is Jesus. And you need him. I know that many of us sometimes we think that we have a relationship with God because you grew up in a house of religion. Religion is not a relationship. The relationship I'm talking to you about is one that God wants to have with you personally. That means that you can go to God the Father directly in the name of Jesus and you can pray, Father, help me. Give me strength. And God wants, to, God wants you to encounter him like the servant prayed. I'm sorry, like Elisha prayed for his servant. God, open his eyes. I'm praying for you today. Father, open their eyes to see something greater than their now. If today's message impacted you in any way and you would like to help us spread the gospel to others by giving a financial gift, please text the number below. And we know that someone's life will be changed as yours was today.